Maybe it's possible you reconsider your your decision to go out of the game? No. Yes, uh, we can win a championship, and it wouldn't change my my thinking. You know, um, I've come to grips with that. My gut basically has, has said this is it, and I'm gonna go with that. Michael, your thoughts on the young guys, Allen and and T Mac, uh, offering to let you start? I, I think it's truly a, a, a good thing. It's a respect for the elders, if you want to look at it in that sense. Um, I would have done it easily because I think that sometimes you have to pay respects to the bridge or the gap from one era to the next, you know, and even if the individual don't accept it, it's just a good gesture for them to do that. And, and I think just to come up with that idea is, shows respect for the game, you know, not just to Michael Jordan, but for the game, you know, and the reason that I wouldn't accept it and I, I don't want to accept it is because I think it says a lot for them to to, to go out and, and, and live up to what the people expect of them, which is why they were voted as starting five, you know. And uh, I'd rather for it to happen that way because I think that's the chain of change. I mean, that's, that's how things happen. That's how change happens. And I don't want to break that chain. You know, I, I've had my chance to start 13 years. You know, the 14 year, I'm not going to lose sleep about. You know, I feel good that you know, that I've been there long enough to see that the fans want to see something else. You know, and that doesn't bother me, that doesn't offend me. I think that's how the game continues to live and survive and in progress. So I would want them to take that progression and move further with it because they're going to be in the same boat somewhere down the road and some young kid probably want to do the same for them somewhere down the road and you know, I don't know what their feelings would be about it, but I would rather for them to pass it on just like I'm passing along. Michael, Rick Haas, Associated Press Television. Um, when you came into the league, you'd be hard-pressed to find a dozen foreign players. Play. Where are you first? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm over here. Okay. When you came into the league, you'd be hard-pressed to find a dozen foreign players participating in the league in the NBA. And you have 12 participating in All-Star Weekend this weekend. What does that say? I mean, they're playing not only participating in the league, but playing at the league's highest level. You see what Dirk's doing, what Yao's doing, what Powell. What does that say about the league and, and, and it, its expansion in your era? And if you could also comment on the fact that a lot of these players who I've talked to this weekend have said that you had a lot to do with the fact that they wanted to play basketball. Well, I think you commend David Stern for the expansion and globalization of basketball, along with, obviously, you know, my talents, Magic Johnson's talent, Larry Bird, all the guys prior to me and with me, you know, also, you know, Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing, those guys. Um, David expanded it to, to where European players understood the competition, the, the, the glamour that came along with it, the, you know, uh, just the experience of playing in, against the best. Uh, the dream team fell in place to where now they got the chance to see it firsthand. You know, 12 of some of the 11 out of the 12 greatest players, not counting Christian Leitner. I mean, he was a young kid. <laughs> Uh, and they got the chance to see those guys in competition and understand, you know, the level of play. And then the guys, I think the European players saw it as an opportunity. Let's go over and experience this. Uh, I think we gave them the, the, the initiative to say, well, they want to be one of the best. And I think because of the way the league really expanded and opened its doors to European basketball, global basketball, gave them an opportunity to come over and see, see what if, you know, along with them seeing the Michael Jordans and the you know, Magic Johnson, David Robinson, these type of guys. So, I mean, um, as much as it's been, you know, myself, you know, as an, as an endorser of NBA basketball, it's been, you know, David Stern for opening up the doors and, you know, understanding how to market the league to where the European and, and Asian or, or, you know, global, globally guys want to come and play at the highest level. Mr. Jordan, uh, basketball magazine from Croatia, Europe. How did you feel when national team of USA lost three games at the World Championship or then from home court? I mean, obviously, I was disappointed. You know, I think that uh, I like to see the United States maintain its dominance of basketball globally. Um, just because I think that the game originated, I think, 
uh, not in, I know it originated in Canada, but it was perfected in the States, and it's our game. And no one likes to see our game being taken away from us and being dominated by someone else. Um, but I think what it did is it, it made us realize that the European, or you know, globally, the guys are catching up. Well, if we take them for granted, they will be caught up. And I think that the next games you will see, you see our best players playing because of that, you know, that respect of getting that we have to get back because of the loss, you know. And so, in essence, the loss may be something of great for or help, you know, may have helped us, you know, that we come back to reality and say, you know, we got to constantly stay focused on working on our, our game here in the States. And if we don't, then, you know, globally, we're going to lose the handle of it. Michael, now that you are nearing the end, how do you expect to look back and evaluate your legacy at some point? And what do you hope that you will have left the basketball world? Um, I want to be the bridge to the next generation, obviously. You know, uh, I played with Dr. J. I played against Dr. J at the time that he was bridging his era to the along with Magic and, and, and Larry, to my generation, or to my era. And I guess I have an obligation to the game is to bridge it to the next, you know. And how I want to be perceived as a guy who played all facets and best, and he played his best in all facets of the game, not just scoring. I mean, obviously, my records are going to be from an offensive standpoint, but I think, you know, like, people understand that I play defense. Uh, I help players better. I won championships. I came from... You know, a team that wasn't, or a franchise that wasn't successful and got it to a point where it was very successful. So, I mean, you know, all these factors I like to be remembered as a part of my legacy. You know, and a guy who truly loved the game, loved to take challenges. You know, always against the, the odds. You know, people said he couldn't do anything. He said he could. Or he, he, he just believed in the unknown that uh, no matter what, he chased it. You know, and I'm not saying everything good happened to him. Some bad things happened, but he always was able to arise above the, uh, the bad things. So, I mean, um, I just want to be remembered in that way as, as a hell of a competitor that you know, never gave up on anything. Michael, over here. Uh, Milton Kemp from the Baltimore Sun. Over here. Where? <laughs> right here. Um, before your arrival, the game was pretty much dominated by the center position and the low post position. Um, now it's pretty much a guard-oriented or forward-oriented game. D two questions. One, do you feel sort of responsible for that? And do you feel after you, you leave, the game will go back to be domi being dominated in the post? Well, I mean, I disagree with you a little bit. I think, um, yes, prior to me, I think it was a big man's game. And I think prior to me, the game started to change. Uh, the versatility aspect came into the game. Magic Johnson playing multiple positions, Larry Bird playing multiple positions. And then myself, Scottie Pippen, Clyde Drexler, Charles Barkley, we all expanded on that versatility. And where the game is today, I wouldn't say it's guard, guard oriented. I think it's more versatile players. I think European players or you know, players from other countries are at a point now, they can play multiple positions. It can give you, give a coach a lot of different, you know, looks. So what I am an example of is versatility. A guy can play multiple positions. I wouldn't say I, I originated that. I think Magic Johnson, even Oscar Robinson back in his day, you know, originated. We, we more or less brought it into focus, made it an impact situation to where you could change the outcome of a game. You know, and Magic changed the outcome of the game with the Lakers when, you know, he could play the center position, the small forward, powerful point guard position, and still win with it. You know, and we, everybody after him and Larry expanded it or brought it more into fruition, made it, you know, a common thing. What everybody, what every general manager looks for now is that type of versatility. So I won't take that credit. I think it was there before me. I just, I guess, with the success that I've had, you know, brought it into focus even greater. The All-Star Game, a lot of people this weekend have been talking about things you've done in All-Star Games, whatever. Do you have any recollections or memories that stand out for you of past All-Star Games? Um, look, the game in New York is, is the game that uh, that I'm, I love the most. It's because it, when you have a, 
a, a star-studded, talented situation, I was able to move the ball around. I, I, I was able to, to get a, a triple-double, you know, when most guys want to see an offensive outpour of scoring. You know, I believe in all facets of the game, and I felt like my impact could be you know, made in different areas instead of just offense. That, too, that was truly my, my best all-star experience, where I was able to to do all facets of the game and, and show that and showcase it in amongst talented players. Sure, I scored 40 in Chicago. I mean, but that was a scoring output. That was what everybody can always attribute to Michael Jordan anyway, is the scoring capabilities. But what I want, you know, to be added as a as a memory is that I played all facets of the game, you know, in terms of rebounding, defense, assists, whatever. And that game to me illustrated that amongst, you know, all the talented players in the league. Um, <clears throat> given your competitive history with you and Isaiah, could you talk about being coached by him in your final All-Star game and what your relationship has evolved to? I mean, it's ironic. I think um, that in our first experience, unbeknownst to me, you know, it was a wedge or ill feelings between the two of us. Until after the All-Star game, I understood or I heard uh, through the press that it was some animosity there, and I never knew that until then. And from that point on, we were kind of off, off the same level. You know, I didn't know him that well, but yet I didn't. I wasn't happy with the way that supposedly he responded to me coming to my first All-Star game. And I can't speak for him, but obviously, if that was true, what he said, or what he he did, then he didn't care for me. And I think over the years, where you know we have competed in competitive environments where, you know, it wasn't much love, a lot of hate. Um, we were able to go against each other. And I think also what, what was earned in that process is mutual respect. You know, that when you look at our basketball talents, Isaiah Thomas can play the game of basketball at the highest level. Michael Jordan can play the, the game of basketball at the highest level. That became a common denominator in our relationship. You know, that's where the, the respect was earned. Since then, we have had dialogue, conversations, and I think beginning of a friendship has established. Now, are you saying that we're best of friends? No, because we hadn't really gotten to that level. Are we mutual friends? Yes, with the sense of respect for where we played the game of basketball. And yes, we have had some time where we've spent some time away from, you know, that environment. I would say right now, we are friends, and a friendship that it will grow because we have distanced ourselves from that type of competition. You know, and I think we've gotten past what was thrown into the mix, you know, when, from initial, uh, from when I first met him. Um, so Sam, that I would say we're friends, you know, and we, with a lot of high respect for our basketball skills, and hopefully that our friendship will continue to grow. Will I ever be best friends with him? I can't honestly say that, you know. And I, I imagine he would say the same, but I think we would be at a friendship to a point where we could, you know, we can be in the same company and have dialogue about, you know, certain things. And it is ironic that, you know, in my last All-Star game, he, we have come complete circle, you know, from the first All-Star game. And I think that's something good. I mean, it's, it's a story that no one, you know, thought would happen, but yet when you look at it, you know, I like to leave the game with a certain respect and a certain friendship that, you know, no one can say, well, you know, I mean, it just got off to a bad start, but yet, you know, I have high respect for Isaiah Thomas, and I, I don't wish bad things on him, I don't hate him, you know, and I just want what's best for him, and I imagine he wants what's best for me, and the best way to do that is to go out, coach player, ironically, and you know, that's how, I, that's how I chronologically understood our relationship over the years. And uh, I, I do not hate the individual. I don't, I don't know him that well to hate him. Time for two final questions right here, and then we're back on the side. Okay, Michael Davis, Squires, BlackVoices.com, Chicago. Uh, we heard from uh, Magic and uh, Charles Barkley on this topic. Could you discuss any uh, aspirations or possibilities that you might have in the 40 man's game of politics? The 40 man game. 40 year old man's game of politics. The 40 year old man game of politics. Um, politics in what sense? In terms of running, running for, for office? Back to the office. And would it be Washington, Illinois, or North Carolina? Let me tell you, uh, 
All those guys, we all got damage in our closets. <laughs> and we all can come to grips with that and then go and, 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 and live in political world or chase that political dream. You know, I support that candidate is going to do that. Me, personally, I have no aspirations politically. You know, if they do, I wish them the best. You know, obviously, they're going to be judged on the merits that they are preaching and they're, they're standing for. I wouldn't expect them to be standing on, on what they have accomplished in the sports arena. You know, and I, and I think that the public is not fooled in that sense. You know, but I don't condemn those guys. As long as they believe in what they believe in, and they're willing to step forward and believe in that, I wish them the best. I have no aspirations politically at all. Uh, I've heard Charles talk about governor, and I heard Magic talk about mayor. You know, I wish them the best, and obviously they know what what they have to, what stands in front of them in the fight, and uh, and I wish them the best. Last question on the side. Greg Amante, ESPN. Michael. Um, what do you make of some of these extreme outbursts or example of player rage that we've seen lately? Are you concerned about stuff like that? I think we all are concerned in terms of uh, against each other as well as against the referees. Uh, and coaches go the same way. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, Jerry Sloan uh, responded you know, that it wasn't something that anybody wants to endorse. I mean, but it's going to have to be a combination of factors used to be the referees, you can go and you can talk to them and communicate with them and ask them about a certain thing or even question certain things. And it's the manner that you do that, I think that they respond, you know, efficiently to. I think both of them, both of, everything's got out of whack since then. You know, the players are more demonstrative in terms of how they respond. Uh, the, the referees are all trying to get respect. They wear the small, tight T-shirts and look like they want to be dominant in terms of you know, some standing there, their, their force. And the coaches want to persuade uh, the, co the, the referees to look at their view of, of uh, how they view the situation. Somehow you got to come to a happy medium, you know. And if we don't, then obviously it's going to leave a bad image on the league. You know, spoiled brats, you know, arguing with guys who want to be macho and want to be a part of the, the picture and they're not. And along with the coaches trying to influence. It's bad right now. And what the league has tried to do is try to penalize each and every act. But when you talk about finding you know, millionaires a certain amount of money, sometimes that's not always the, the, the best case scenario. I think the, the, the players have to take uh, approach in that you got to play the game no matter how you look at it. These are three individuals out there just trying to keep order. They're not going to make the every call right. You know, and the referee's going to have to look at is they're not a part of the show. They are a part of the show, but they're not a part of the show in a sense. You're not going to get, you know, shoe endorsements. You're not going to get any kind of lucrative deals just because you're a referee. The fans don't pay to see the referees. So they, they're going to have to bring their ego down. The players going to have to bring their egos down. And the coach is certainly going to have to do the same. That's the only way you're going to solve the issue. You know, right now it's totally out of control. And until all three parties come together and try to bring down the, the emotion a little bit, it's going to be, you know, something that's going to always, you know, going to be a case that can blow up in your face. Now, I have different methods in terms of how I deal with the referees, and, you know, I, I do it respectfully. You know, I do it in a way with that you don't embarrass the referees. You know, if you see me when I'm talking to the referees, if I have something that may be misconstrued by a word of, you know, people can hear or see, I put, put my shirt over my mouth and I say it. You know, as long as the referee feels like they're not getting embarrassed, or bringing the whole arena down on them, I think they respond well, you know. And but if you're going to do it in a way that's going to embarrass them, they got to respond. That's, they got the power of the whistle, and they know that, you know. And when you got two, you know, those two types of things that can bust the game, or break a game, or bring focus to the to the game that we don't want to bring focus to the game, it's going to have to be some give and take, you know, on both sides. That's my opinion. Thank you. All right. This concludes the press conference. A transcript of this will be available on Media Central as well as in... Well, two weeks shy or less than two weeks shy of his 40th birthday. And look at the numbers on Michael Jordan for this NBA season so far. 18.8 points per game.